I called out that there would be a lot of trash L2s. These trash L2s are centralized things that run out of some guy's laptop and uh, there's absolutely no merit to them whatsoever. I called this out, that game is being played out. I was in ETH Denver recently and there was no shortage of, of, tra of trash L2s on display there. And I think by now, even the Ethereum community has begun to understand that the L2 vision, with its fragmented liquidity, with its fragmented programming models, with its fragmented universe, is not a good universe to be operating in. People who know us know that we are the team that has brought the most amount of technology to crypto, period. After Satoshi. That's just a fact. Emin, it's great to have you at The Defiant. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's always fun to chat with The Defiant. It's great to be back. I'm really excited to chat with you. I was thinking maybe we can start with a catch up because uh, we had you on uh, over two years ago, almost uh, in February of 2022, last time we had you at The Defiant. And um, in retrospect, this was the early stages of, of the bear market. And right now it seems like we've come full circle and we're seemingly at the start of another bullish trend. Um, that being said, I just like to start with like a catch up to hear um, how the bear period was for you and for the avalanche ecosystem. Sure. Um, I happen to love bear markets. Bear markets are for builders. The bull markets bring out all the scammers. Everybody essentially in a bull market comes out. They look around at the few people who are doing actual work. They copy the language that those few people are using. Typically, you know, Avalanche is one of the most copied uh, narrative makers out there. And, uh, and then it becomes a really difficult issue where in a bull market where everybody is trying to come up with the quickest way of, of, uh, of making money, uh, it becomes really hard to discern the people with staying power from those people who are just here today, gone tomorrow. We saw this with the previous bull market, and I couldn't really point out which of my competitors I knew weren't going to be around, but all of them that I knew weren't going to be around are no longer with us. They just kind of wed, just disappeared into oblivion. I generally, as I said, love bears. And bears are times for building, and Avalanche built out an enormous foundation during the bear market. Uh, we established the supremacy of the subnet view. We came into the scene saying that, that blockchains needed two things. One, they needed a faster consensus protocol, that all-to-all -all communication protocols were not going to scale, and they don't. And so Avalanche is the only consensus protocol of the many thousands of systems out there. It's the only one where, where you don't need to have every validator hear from every other validator to make a decision with high certainty. So. Uh, that, that has been proven, and, um, and that is one of the main things that gives Avalanche its, uh, its uh, performance characteristics. And the second thing we said was, it's a multi-chain world, that there cannot be a single chain, that, that Ethereum with one chain, or Solana with one chain, these are not systems that can rise up to meet the world's demands. A, a, sooner or later, a high demand application comes onto these chains, Ethereum has already demonstrated it, and then soaks up all the available bandwidth and leaves nothing for the other, other use cases. And in many cases, the use cases are so disparate that you need different virtual machines. You need entirely different infrastructure for the different use cases that, uh, that the single chain cannot accommodate them. So that vision has been vetted out during the bear market. And now we're going into this, what I would call a proto bull or something of that kind, the early bull market in great shape. We have a large number of industrial partnerships in the works. We have a lot of partnerships with Wall Street firms where they want to have a bespoke, where they want to have a, 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 a walled garden style chain of their own in, in small consortia, and we can deliver it. Avalanche can deliver that. We're going into it with some AAA g a games coming on to Avalanche. Every single one of these games are so demanding that they really need a system that works. So BS alone and Crypto Mumbo Jumbo are not sufficient for these games. They, they really need something that works and therefore they flock to Avalanche. We're going into it with real world assets on top of the Avalanche platform and we're going into it with a consolidated user base 
uh, all jazzed up about meme coins and, and other stuff and NFTs and so forth um, that, uh, that rendered the whole thing incredibly uh, appealing as a platform in general, not to mention all of those things that are happening in different regions. In Korea alone, we did a partnership with SK Planet, for example, that signed up about uh, what they say is 35 million users. And uh, we have seen about three and a half million of those so far. Like, these are really large numbers. Like these, this, these are not numbers that my competitors can even dream about. And uh, and so Avalanche is going into these into the new bull in a, in a pretty uh, in pretty strong form. So I'm really happy about where we. Oh, uh, and of course. Uh, during the bear market at, at Ava Labs, we were busy building a lot of infrastructure for Avalanche. So uh, I hope we will, in due course of time, talk about those as well. But we built the Core Wallet, and the Core Wallet is a new approach to how to interact with chains. Uh, we built out the um, the Enclave uh, uh, Exchange, which is a trustworthy exchange. It's in, in, in many ways, it's a response to FTX. It prohibits malfeasance by the exchange operator. Um, and uh, we built out a hell of a lot of other uh, other uh, tools and toolkits and so forth that uh, I'm happy to go into in more detail. But yeah, we're going into the bull in, in great shape. Awesome. That was a great summary. And uh, later in the call, we're going to go through all of those different verticals that you just mentioned. So um, before we go any further, I'd love to also hear um, for, for new audience members and newcomers who are tuning into crypto right now. Um, can you possibly give us a primer to yourself, also to what Avalanche is and uh, what led you to building it? Sure. Um, I started in uh, in building computers. I started building computer systems back in the 80s, in the late 80s when I was in high school. And I was always fascinated by building really large scale systems that self-organize and, and work themselves. That drew me into operating systems at first. So I did, I studied at Princeton and went on to do a PhD. In, uh, in operating systems. And um, just as I was becoming a young professor, uh, I became a professor at Cornell. I served as a professor for 19 years. Um, when I was a young professor in early 2001, um, the peer-to-peer -peer revolution was taking place. And, um, and what, what I saw the world need was a way to make sure that peer-to-peer -peer systems behaved well. And um, at the time, people just generally wanted to download data. Nobody wanted to upload data. There's always, a, this is a, known in economics as the tragedy of the commons. And that's a very, very frequently encountered problem. Everybody wants to take things. Nobody wants to give things. So back in those days, I invented a system called Karma with proof of work minting in it. So the year then was 2002. It was published in 2003. And so that's about six years before Bitcoin. Then Bitcoin came along um, and Satoshi improved on that idea of proof of work minting with proof of work consensus. And that was a huge step up from what I had built up. And then I found the biggest known flaw in, in Bitcoin known as selfish mining and um, with my coworkers. And um, then uh, later I did a bunch of research on everything blockchain. I looked at how to build layer twos that are fast. I looked at how to build uh, a whole bunch of other infrastructure for, uh, for, uh, for, you know, for example, for how to keep coins uh, safe at rest, for uh, uh, characterizing the decentralization of different chains, for building lightweight consensus protocols, and so on. And at the end of that road, um, I found myself looking at the Avalanche protocol and uh, decided to, to build uh, uh, an entire system based on this big breakthrough that gives us the world's lightest weight, fastest, lowest latency um, a protocol for making decisions in a very large self-organizing system that can have bad actors in it that will then be curtailed. I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on the current state of, of the blockchain landscape. So um, Avalanche is is a layer one blockchain project. And we have seen the emergence of numerous layer one solutions in the past couple of years. And even today we had a, a announcement of another layer one solution with, with one of the largest uh, raises, I believe, of the year. And uh, the efforts of to scale Ethereum are still ongoing. Um, we are seeing an even more competitive L1 scene. So did you see this coming? And how do you evaluate the current um, landscape. We completely saw this coming. Those of you who are listening to my uh, podcast, 
will know that I called this out maybe five years ago, that there would be a vicious L1 battle, that there would be lots and lots of pretenders, that there would be a lot of noise that all sounds the same, and there will be lots of claims of novelty. And uh, among all these claims of novelty, and I, you know, I usually use this example, right? So suppose, uh, suppose there's, a, there's a whole bunch of people, suppose we're talking about hats, right? It's really easy to take a hat that somebody else has desi designed, put a feather on it, now you have a fat with a feather on it, you have a hat with a feather on it. And it's, it sounds like a novel item. It is novel. It's never been done before. And you can try to sell this to the masses as if it's a new invention. But at the end of the day, it's just a stupid hat. And among all this, Avalanche came into the scene as if it's an umbrella. It brought, brings an entirely different technique. It's not just a single chain. It's a multitude of chains that work together as an ensemble. When we were talking about this, nobody else was. I kept talking about how in my podcast, um, how the Avalanche vision has been so resilient. In the time that we were just hammering the same point home, my competitors have flipped around five different times. For the longest time, Ethereum scalability problems were going to be solved by verifiable delay functions. For another long period, verifiable random functions were going to solve them. Then accumulators were going to solve those problems. Then ZK Sync was about to solve those problems. None of them were solutions. And I could have told you that that was going to happen, and I did. I told my audience that that's exactly what was going to happen, that these people would continually flip because they did not quite understand the technology, they did not have that pragmatist point of view, and they couldn't foresee the technological path uh, that they were embarking on. Amongst all this, you will also hear about new people coming onto the scene, making a lot of noise, as I said again, copying much of the noise from people who know what they're doing. There will be people who come in and they'll be like, oh, I have a new virtual machine. It's so trivial to come up with a new virtual machine. It's just child's play. Is Ethereum virtual machine the best there is? No. You and I could come up with a new virtual machine right now uh, by 8 p.m. tonight in like about five hours. We'd be done and we'd have a new VM. But the world isn't asking for a new VM. That's not where the play is. Every time you come in with a, with a new VM, you're actually at a huge disadvantage. What you think you're selling to the traders as an advantage sounds to the developers like the stupidest thing there is. It says, I, I need everybody, I need the world to change its programming model because I came up with a new virtual machine. That's the dumbest thing you could be saying. So techies know this, but traders don't. And then traders do that asinine thing of making a, a bet on coins that they don't understand. So I call this, and it's there, I find none of this surprising, and it's just part of uh, the game in some sense. And it's, in some bigger sense, it's not a problem at all. Um, here's the trend that I'm seeing. The, um, the new virtual, sorry, the new systems, the new L1s that are coming online, they're typically coming online with new VMs that are slightly modified versions of old stuff that we knew. They don't bring something really major to the scene. And so we've seen the amount of innovation in new chains go down lower and lower and lower. And at some point, and I think that point is within the next year or so, at some point, everybody will understand what the techies already know, which is these new chains don't bring much new into the scene. Whatever they're doing, we all already knew how to do, we already understood. They might be better engineered in some sense, they might, be, uh, they might have some advantages because they're a fresh chain, they're, uh, they're starting out with a database of zero items in it, you know, so initially, in the initial days, they're, they're somewhat fast, but as time goes on, they, their advantages disappear. And the huge disadvantage that they came into the world with, which is you have to toss out everything you know and learn a new programming language and learn a new programming paradigm, that problem is actually a huge albatross around their necks. So, um, so I think we're going to see those asinine plays go down in number. I also called out the L2 game. That I called out that there would be a lot of trash L2s. These L2s are all going to be either running with no fraud proofs, so you, you have to trust the operator, or they run with a, decent, with a centralized sequencer. So you have to uh, either be MEV'd out, or again, you'll be, uh, you'll be, you'll be built by whoever is running this thing on their laptop. 
So these trash L2s are centralized things. They run out of some guy's laptop, and uh, there's absolutely no merit to them whatsoever. I called this out. That game is being played out. I was in East Denver recently, and there was no shortage of, of, tra of trash L2s on display there. And I think by now, even the Ethereum community has begun to understand that the L2 vision with its fragmented liquidity, with its fragmented programming models, with its fragmented universe, is not a good universe to be operating in. So I think Avalanche stands apart from all of this. We have a unified vision of chains communicating with each other seamlessly. We have a unified vision for how you might want to bring in uh, different VMs on the different chains, but still have them talk to each other, still have them support interoperability and therefore result in a system that's much better than all of the competitors combined. So I think we're in a very good situation with Avalanche. I don't mind the competition the least bit, the more the merrier. And uh, I think uh, in the long term, the people who bring innovation to, this, to the scene are the ones that, that pull apart, that, that, you know, that, that just essentially pull apart from the crowds. And Avalanche has been doing exactly that ever since its launch. So we'll continue to do that, and none of that bothers me the least bit. So looking ahead, um, where do you see things going uh, forward, and what do you think the ideal outcome will be in a, I guess, um, a utopian scenario for blockchains? A utopian scenario or a realistic scenario? I'll share my utopian scenario. Okay. So share both. Share both. I'll share both. I'll share both. Why not? So the utopian scenario is in this cycle, people realize that um, people outside of crypto realize that crypto has enormous benefits to that it can offer to their lines of work. They start digitizing their assets on uh, on various chains using techniques that we've supported on Avalanche or our competitors are beginning to support now or, or will support in the future. And, um, and then ultimately, we move to a universe where I don't have to trust the say-so of some random person who's operating a web service. Instead, I go to a, a blockchain service and I know what the blockchain service will do exactly for me. I'm not, I'm, I won't be at the behest of the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. I won't be at the mercy of, uh, you know, of the Googles of the world and so on who buy and package our data and sell it. So, uh, or I won't be at the mercy of my bank who acts as an intermediary and takes a hefty cut and uh, attaches all kinds of fees and so forth. So that's one vision, the utopian vision. The realistic scenario is uh, that we're going in, hopefully we're going into a big bull cycle and um, depending on the outcome of the election, that bull cycle might go crazy up uh, or might, get, might, might go down a bit, who knows, um, but uh, uh, there are some unknowables. But, um, but my, realistically, what's going to happen is, um, is that, uh, that, uh, that this cycle will be a noisy one. There will be a whole lot of scammers again, and, um, and, uh, and so they will cause, uh, you know, they'll create a lot of noise. They will sound exactly the same as everybody else. They will, in fact, be copying the hard, hardworking people who are bringing new, exciting uh, things into this space, exactly like Sam Bankman-Fried did with his, with his fraudulent exchange. Everybody was telling me that Sam was a brilliant guy. And, and I happen to love curly-haired people who are brilliant, right? So I was like, oh, there's, there's another one. I kind of like that. I mean, it turned out he wasn't smart at all. He was dumb as rocks. He was a sociopath, and he was stealing everybody's money. I worry that this new cycle is a cycle that we're going into with, uh, again, with very little regulatory oversight. The regulators have decided to fight crypto at its core, which was a huge mistake and they have not really taken a, a more discerning approach and tried to identify the bad apples from the, the, the good people who are working hard in this space. And therefore, I worry that this, this cycle will realistically end with another ginormous fraudulent meltdown. I'm not sure where it's gonna be or who it's gonna be. And, uh, and at the end of that meltdown, um, finally, hardcore regulations will come into, that, into the space. That's my worry. And, um, and that's, that's, I think, the more realistic outcome, given the greed that I see, given the kind of people that I see being attracted to the space who are trying to fill the void that SBF left after he left FTX.
So from what I understand from from your take is there's like very nuanced differences between uh, the, 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 the VMs and there's no need to actually uh, produce more VMs. So do you think uh, people are unrightfully overlooking Avalanche's products or Avalanche's offerings? And do you think like within a near future, they will realize that actually Avalanche had all the answers that um, they, they were looking for and they're going to flock everything else and just uh, com- come together at uh, Avalanche? Well, um, I, I would not put it that way. I would definitely not use the word unrightfully. You know, there's, a, there's the correct time for everything and there's a process for everything. So when Avalanche, the consensus protocol was first unveiled, academics were staunchly against it. They were like, no, this can't possibly work. You can't achieve consensus without having all the validators talk to all the other validators. You have to just, all you can do are the types of, you know, to get performance, all you can do are the types of tricks that Solana is employing to try to get performance out of these systems. You know, you can throw hardware at it, you can maybe do, you know, sort of hokey things to cut corners, etc. And uh, that's what they used to say. And it took them, it took academics who are trained to be open-minded. It took them years to realize, oh, you know what, this thing is actually fundamentally different and it works. And there are some sound reasons for why it works. So, in that same sense, the market is what it is. It has that invisible hand uh, that is um, uh, that, that's hard to control, that's hard to discern. So, um, so what does that mean? It means that um, you know when the time is right, everyone will flock to Avalanche. I think you're seeing this with AAA game developers. They need a system that works. They come to Avalanche. They don't waste time dilly-dallying with people who are just making noise. We've also seen Nexon, for example. We've seen a whole bunch of uh, really large game developers take a lot of money from, from projects that had no technology, only future promises, and, uh, and then Nexon uh, left, even after, like, after having taken a whole lot of money from these other projects that bribed them to come onto their chains, they left those guys and came to Avalanche and took not a cent from us because we had the superior technology. So, uh, so that's sort of the situation. I think, uh, you know, if you, if you do well, people will eventually recognize you. The problem in this space is people measure everything by money, and there's a lot more speculative money versus real money. And uh, what you end up seeing is that, you know, of course, the coin rankings are, are mostly denomina- denominated by speculation, and, uh, you know, people do asinine things to try to pull ahead there. And that's, that's fine. That, that will always happen in a, in a fast-moving, uh, quickly evolving scene such as crypto. So I, I think it's all okay. Um, in the long term, if somebody outpaces our pace of development, if somebody outdoes our li- uh, rate of innovation, if somebody brings in more science to this field than we have, then they'll pull ahead of us. But... Otherwise, if you if you you know if you think what if you want to ask me what I think will happen in ten years, Bitcoin will be an avalanche subnet, and Ethereum will be an avalanche subnet because just just the right place for them to be, and avalanche the approach is going to be vetted by everybody. If they don't do that, what they will end up doing is they will end up trying to copy avalanche, but they'll be years behind us. And that's a losing game for whoever tries to do the copying. There's not a single developing country, as you all know, that has managed to pull ahead by copying technology. So, uh, so I'm very confident about where we are, I'm very confident about our vision, and I'm very confident about our historical track record where we have never had to backtrack, where we've been delivering on a, on a rapid pace on the same vision. You recently tweeted out uh, what was essentially like a public service announcement, which highlights the importance of separating signal from noise. And uh, just to quote you, uh, you said, in the last cycle, scalability and performance were the outstanding problems and Avalanche and Solana provided two approaches to tackle them. So in the current cycle, we saw uh, Solana make a incredible comeback. Do you think Avalanche lagged behind Solana with this um, surge in interest? And do you think we're going to see something similar happen with Avalanche? So uh, let me answer that question from two different perspectives, economically and technologically. So technologically, Avalanche has always been miles ahead of Solana. Solana is a single chain system. Avalanche is a multi-chain system. The two are incomparable. Solana's bandwidth, Solana's capacity is capped It can only do so many transactions per second. If you throw more, it starts behaving really, really badly. 
uh, whereas Avalanche can always spin up a new subnet and, and handle more, more add more capacity. So that's a big, big difference between those two systems. And sort of as a technical ethos perspective, um, Solana gets its performance characteristics from engineering, whereas Avalanche gets its performance from better science. So Solana is pushing the, you know, they're building the fastest, fastest horse and buggy that you could imagine. And the fastest horse and buggy, you know, if you attach, you know, whatever, 20 horses uh, to a little cart, it can go pretty darn fast, right? Um, whereas Avalanche is kind of like, an, a, a, like a, like a v, V4 engine. Uh, we started out as a V4 engine, now be, being upgraded to a, to a V8 maybe. And, uh, and the initial V4s were not as good as, as horses and buggies. They were slower initially. So uh, we have a lot of engineering ahead of us, but we don't need new science. We are superior. We are. We have the superior science, and um, and uh, and now, especially with the recent changes with the D upgrade on on Avalanche, uh, we're looking at performance that's really, really. Uh, actually, with the E upgrade, we're looking at performance that's off the charts. With Hyper VM, we're looking at performance that is way off the charts compared to everybody else. So that's true. I think that's just technologically. You know, techies can verify these statements for themselves. Um, but economically, Avalanche has lagged behind. Solana has had um, has had an amazing run, economically speaking. And I'll tell you the reasons for this from the last cycle. For the longest time in the in the previous bull cycle, I did not understand how Solana was performing so well compared to us. I looked at it as a techie and I was like, look, this is just a run of the mill system. There's nothing here. They just pulled the plugs, made it go fast. If you do that, it will, it will stall every now and then and you'll crash. That's exactly what used to happen to Solana. It still does. So, uh, but then it turned out when Alameda crashed, it turned out that they were outperforming us economically because Sam was selling other people's AVAX and buying SAM tokens, Solana, Serum, FTT. So this is all a matter of court records. This is all stuff that has come out as a matter of, of uh, court verified proceedings. So uh, in the last bull cycle, let me repeat, Solana and Avalanche went head to head in a manner that defied logic for a technologically inclined person. And, um, and it turned out that the reason they went head to head is because there was a huge market imbalance. Somebody was fraudulently selling people's AVAX and buying Solana. So um, imagine how strong our rise up would have been had that not happened. That's a, that's a matter for the history books. That's a matter for aficionados to sort out, you know, 10, 20 years from now. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was heartbreaking to see, and, uh, but it is what it is. So that's what happened there. Um, now, what's going to happen? In the, what's been happening in this cycle? Well, in this bull cycle, uh, Solana had a very good run, partly due to a short squeeze and maybe to other stuff that we don't know about yet. And um, that's okay. That's fine. You know, I, I don't know everything that happens around the world. We typically find out way too late and, and way after the fact. And um, and it's fine. Once again, um, in the long term, the only systems that will be around are those that can handle the capacity requirements of all these demanding applications. Single chain systems have no chance. So Solanas of the world, Ethereums of the world are single chain systems. They can only handle so much. And Avalanche stands apart. And so as we get more demand, we're going to see more and more deployments who come to Avalanche because they need something that works. As long as the space is speculative, as long as the use cases are synthetic, constructed, fake, etc., then, uh, then of course it's a different universe. Then everybody looks kind of awash, etc. But uh, but as we get more genuine users of blockchains, then the technologies that accommodate them will stand apart, as Avalanche has been. So I'm not really concerned about these uh, you know differences in the short short term. Um, but in the long term, I know which systems are going to be ahead. Uh, from a technological perspective, um, who do you think your competitors are uh, in the current landscape? I'll tell you who my comp competition is. My competition isn't really Solana. I don't compete with Solana. I like Anatoly very much. I like the Solana community very much. They should push the engineering envelope. 
And um, as we adopt some of the tricks that they have, uh, they have uh, shown to be viable, and as we avoid the, the pitfalls that they've fallen into, we're going to have those exact same improvements as well. So Solana is not my competition. Ethereum is not my competition. I love Vitalik. He's a great guy. We're close friends and um, he's a wonderful person. I've had so many interactions with him over the years, starting as a professor. Um, and so uh, no issues there. My competition, as I've always seen it, is Wall Street. My competition is the current world as it is. My competition are all those entrenched, vertically closed up systems that capture their users. It's the Charles Schwab's of the world. It's, it's everybody else that I'm not going to name because many of them are now trying to come onto the blockchain world and open up their systems and they're actually working with us. So, um, so that's really the friendly competition that, that I want to steer Avalanche towards. We need to get blockchains to be less speculative uh, systems and more uh, speculative coin trading systems and more genuine new financial rails for a hell of a lot of different kinds of operations from insurance to banking to retail banking to investment banking to funds to everything else financial and value bearing that's where I think the, the inter interesting use cases lie so from the get-go we targeted that and from the get-go, yes, as a technologically opinionated person, I will call out issues with my competitors, you know, what I would call competitors. But, um, uh, but I, I always sought to expand the space. We always tried to bring on more assets onto, uh, into the crypto space. And we've been very successful at this with our partnership with KKR. We brought in the KKR Health Fund which is a very coveted fund, and now you can buy shares in it uh, through, um, through, uh, through Avalanche. And uh, we brought in a, whole, a hell of a lot of uh, real-world assets onto Avalanche. My eye has always been towards expanding the crypto space, bringing more assets into our universe, showing the world how much better things are when the underlying infrastructure is based on the blockchain. Awesome. Uh, I wanted to double down on that because the next question was actually just going back to the um, the, the same tweet. Uh, you said, these days I believe the blockers have to do with supporting multiple use cases on the same platform and integrating with TradFi. So um, can we assume that the current focus uh, at Avalanche is to fill in this gap in the market? Yes, absolutely. So, um, and there are many different ways that this uh, surfaces. Let's start with the simplest case. So um, everybody's familiar with, let's say, um, you know, um, a, a single block, single chain system like Ethereum. Ethereum isn't, uh, or Bitcoin is, is even better. Bitcoin doesn't have a jurisdiction. Okay, so the, it has only one main asset, which is BTC, and uh, Bitcoin is something that just works globally, and it's kind of like the Avalanche C chain in that sense. That's great for the Bitcoin asset, but it's not good if you are in the business of digitizing real estate. That real estate is tied to certain laws. That real estate has to be handled in a manner governed by the, the jurisdiction in which it's located. You can't just be like, I'm going to have some real, real estate that who's, who, you know, the legality of which is governed by these other rules and I defy any land, etc. No, you're going to have your assets seized if that happens, right? So you need to be able to bridge the gap between the real world in which we live and the virtual assets that you might want to issue if you're in possession of valuable assets. The only way to do this is to, to allow us to have a chain uh, whose validators are, uh, are in a particular legal jurisdiction who comply with that legal jurisdiction. You might very well need, for Wall Street folks, you might need a US chain. For Europeans, you might need a GDPR compliant EU chain. For Chinese people, you might want to need, you might have to need, you might have to use a particular Chinese chain, and so on. Indian users will have to have their own chain governed by Indian laws. And Avalanche is in a, in a fantastic position to, to facilitate this. And that's what we've been working on, and going forward, that's exactly what we want to allow to have happen. I want every app to have its own app chain. Apps should not be able to interfere with each other. Your app becoming popular should not mean that my app users pay high fees. And uh, your app being constrained by American laws should not impact somebody else who is operating out of the EU, for example. 
Avalanche can make all of this happen. We've been working on this technology called Teleporter that, while making this happen, allows these chains to communicate with each other seamlessly. So the EU chain, for example, can issue a message to the US chain or vice versa and have these guys talk to each other and send messages and value to, towards each other. You can have your EU assets move to the US chain under well-defined rules and then be subject to DeFi operations in the US, again subject to well-defined rules. So that's what we've been working on and uh, I'm really proud to see the results. We've also been working on making this all seamless. If you use MetaMask, a multi-chain universe sounds like a terrible idea to you. That's because every, ch every chain switch is just so laborious, so difficult. You manually have to do all sorts of funky things, and uh, it's just not a good universe to switch from one chain to another using an ancient uh, browser like uh, MetaMask. But if you were to use a proper wallet, if you use, for example, the core wallet from Ava Labs, uh, you will find that it's seamless to switch from subnet to subnet to subnet. And in fact, you might not even have to realize you're switching subnets when you perform operations. We even have applications that straddle multiple subnets. They hold assets on one chain, perform operations on another chain. And these are all entirely normal within the Avalanche universe, whereas it might sound like science fiction to an Ethereum user or to a Solana user. So we're going to get into the core wallet uh, in just a bit. But uh, before we get in there, uh, I'm just curious to hear um, if you can talk about the most prominent use cases at uh, Avalanche at the moment. Most prominent ones? Um, there are so many, I wouldn't know where to begin. I'll, I'll just give you a few. In fact, <laughs> if I try to do a, 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 you know, if I say here are the most prominent use cases, I will not be able to, uh, people will attack me the, the day after this is aired. So um, all my friends will turn on me and, and they'll send me nasty grams all night long and so on. So let me tell you about just a few of them that I'm really excited about. I'm really excited about these games that are coming online. Some of them are AAA rated games. Um, Shrapnel came online. I, uh, I played that game. Um, Somebody kept killing me behind the truck, so I was not able to extract. So whoever that was, you know, I hate them, but, uh, but it was really fun. And uh, it's a really good uh, Battle Royale type game. Uh, another Battle Royale that's coming out online that I'm really, really excited about is Off the Grid. It's an amazing game. Just beautiful, futuristic, sci-fi, gritty. It's a universe where people have, have uh, decided to cut off their arms and legs, so you you kill someone, you take their arm, etc. Uh, you take their, their body armor and guns and so forth, and you try to go on different missions. Uh, the rendering is amazing, the dirt, the grittiness is just really well done. Uh, so anyway, so these games are fantastic. I'm not a gamer. Um, I just played uh, Shrapnel for a little bit, I played Off the Grid for a little bit, and uh, these games were so captivating, so addictive, and I just found myself getting addicted to off the grid immediately, which kind of was scary actually, it's that good of a game. And I kept seeing in my dreams that, uh, that island that the game is set on. So, um, games are so really before good. before we Go move on to the next, uh, I, I guess, sector, let's just stay on game five for, for a second. Sure. Um, so Shrapnel, uh, I saw some videos of it, uh, I, I watched some walkthroughs, it looks nice. Well, well, let me put it this way, it doesn't look crap, because most of the crypto projects, crypto gaming projects look like crap. So, yeah. so I'm, I, I, I'm very interested and curious to try it out, hopefully I'll do it uh, sometime soon. Mm -hmm. And um, Off the Grid sounds interesting as well. Um, and I also saw that uh, Maple Story, which is a oh, very yeah. popular uh, role-playing game coming out of so South Korea, uh, is also partnering with Avalanche. So, um, can you possibly just go through these three di different games and talk about what exactly the partnership partnership is, and what the um, blockchain component is, uh, or the integration is with within these games? Sure. Um Let's see, I can talk about Shrapnel and Off the Grid in detail. I don't know the Maple Story uh, story all that well, uh, but uh, let me give you sort of the high level stuff. For Shrapnel and for Off the Grid, the main use for the blockchain is for storing your assets. And uh, the assets belong there, the arms, the legs, the, uh, the body armor, and especially the guns and ammo. Uh, Off the Grid is all about guns and ammo. Their, their main, uh, uh, main token is called gun. Um, and uh, it's all about acquiring guns and, and, and you know, shooting stuff. 
And uh, they ended up hiring, by the way, the gun design team from, from Call of Duty. And I met the guy in charge. Uh, looks exactly like a, you would expect a gun designer to look, you know, sort of, you know, high cheekbones, kind of sunken cheeks, just uh, looks like he just stays awake all night thinking about guns. I was like, do you stay awake all night thinking about guns? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, so, really cool Ukrainian guy. And, um, and I said, you know, uh, you surely must have gotten um, some job offers from, from gun manufacturers. And he was like, yes, uh, you know, I got an offer from Kalashnikov, the, you know, the famous uh, gun manufacturer. And, uh, but, but why would I take it? It's just a step down in, in every way compared to what I do on a daily, daily basis. So uh, Off the Grid has amazing gun design. Uh, shrapnel has great uh, scenery. It's, it's out now, it's out earlier. And um, just uh, fantastic scenarios, multiplayer uh, universe. And so uh, in all of these games, the uh, blockchain is used in exactly the way it should be used. The game itself does not take place on the blockchain. The, the game itself is not about making money. Okay, it's not about you buy my token and I buy your token. That's not about that at all. It's really about great gameplay. Give people a fantastic experience and let them thrive. And the blockchain is used to make sure that the in-game assets are kept on a neutral platform and on an open platform where you can use those assets for other sorts of things. Um, the Maple Story decision, I don't quite know exactly what they're going to do. They, of course, keep their assets on the blockchain as well. I'm not sure to what extent they are planning to open their platform, whether they will allow you to upload uh, elements of your own design or they, whether they will allow third parties to upload elements of their own design into the game universe. That's an interesting opening for all these games. So it's one thing to have a game that's closed. It's another thing to have a game that is on a blockchain, so the assets are on a neutral platform. It's yet another thing to open it up so that other people can add assets of their own design. So I'm not sure where uh, Maple uh, Story is going to end up, uh, but I'm excited to see what will happen. Uh, so Avalanche has gotten so big that I personally cannot be involved in every project anymore. So I haven't been able to follow everything that's happening. We roughly have like 15 more minutes to go, but uh, over the course of the conversation, the sun has really made up its way to your face. Do you think you're going to need sunglasses or, or sun, sunscreen before we continue? Absolutely. Or? I was, I'm dying here. <laughs> I, I, regret, I regret not turning the AC on. If you can give me a minute, maybe I'll turn the AC on. Can I do that? Absolutely. Like get, get comfortable. Yes, yes. Thank you. Well, this is the max I can do right now. It's, the sun is going to be in my face, but at least I won't be sweating uh, the, the whole time through the interview. I just wanted to move over to the uh, meme coin rush. Uh, sure. There was it's it's a new sort of liquidity incentive program from Avalanche with uh, one million dollars uh, in in funding. So you, can you possibly go into the um, the details of this uh, fund and how projects or people can um, be involved with it? Sure. Um, look, meme coins are here to stay, right? Meme coins have been around for a very long time. When I was first um, you know, introducing students to, uh, to, to uh, the world of cryptocurrencies, I would tell them, well, you know, here's how Bitcoin works, but don't, don't go use Bitcoin because it's valuable. You're going to lose your coins, or you might. Uh, it's much better to use Dogecoin. So Doge was followed by Shiba Inu. Um, and there, were, there have been many, many, many different um, meme coins since then. So um, let's talk a little bit about meme coins, right? So initially, so if you're a sort of an older person, the, the question you might want to ask is, where do these things get their value? Do these things seem like worthless things? Why would anybody trade them, et cetera, et cetera? And, uh, and you know, and there's a visceral reaction that I see in some people that says, oh, meme coins are just, just BS. They should disappear altogether, et cetera. And um, I, I used to have some of these questions myself, but if you hang around the meme coin community, then, or the meme coin people, you realize that there's something bigger going on. People will trade whatever they want to trade. They trade Beanie Babies, they trade all sorts of useless trinkets, they trade, you know, glimmering rocks of different kinds, you know, gold, diamonds, etc. You leave them alone, they will trade. Meme coins provide a way for, for uh, people to create community around the idea of a coin, and they allow people to do trading uh, where the, the sort of the, the people who pull ahead are those people who are socially best connected. 
A great meme coin trader is somebody who understands what will make it big, which communities will flourish, which connect, which people, who, who in their connectivity graph of, 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 the, of the world uh, is going to make it big and who will not. So that's, a, that's highly valuable information. And, um, and the people who boast about their meme coin gains are essentially boasting about their social connectivity. It's a way to prove to the world that you are hip. And there is a lot to be said about that. Just look at what old people do to prove that they're still hip, right? And then they turn around and say, oh, meme coins are BS. No, whatever you're doing to show that you still have, you know, have got it is BS. And meme coins are exactly in line with, with, with all of those things, except they're even cooler and a much more direct measure of how hip anybody is. So I happen to love meme coins. And I've come to love them over time, and, um, and they're great. There's fun to see. They great, create great community, and, um, and there's a whole lot of excitement that happens around them. And um, so the Avalanche Foundation ended up deciding that uh, it wants to support meme coin, um, meme coin communities uh, that flourish on Avalanche. And as a result, we've had some uh, great runs uh, of various different coins that uh, were launched on Avalanche that did insanely well beyond anybody's wildest expectations. And, um, and really great to see that. I'd like to get your thoughts on the, um, the DeFi landscape in Avalanche. Do you see anything interesting being built there? Uh, what are some primary projects that you can uh, perhaps mention to us? Sure. Um, there's a lot going on in Avalanche. And in fact, I was going to come to, I was going to mention when you asked the question about, you know, what's happening on Avalanche, we talked about games. My next uh, topic was going to be social find and the next, next topic was going to be DeFi. Uh, DeFi on Avalanche is really strong. And um, all of the blue chip uh, uh, projects that you, you've heard about are on Avalanche. So the Aves of the world are on, on us. But we also have our own unique um, sort of uh, technologically groundbreaking projects. What are some of these? Obviously Trader Joe, obviously Banky, and, and many others. Trader Joe is a lot easier to use and has a much nicer model than Uniswap. It's worth a look. It's a great system. Uh, and it's a lot easier to manage. And you will make more money using that than, than Uniswap. Um, so it's just fairly straightforward uh, to check this claim out. Take a look. Last time I looked, it was much easier to manage and the returns were far higher. Uh, mostly because, you know, it's people have automated the, the living crap out of Uniswap yield farming and, um, and Avalanche has not had that level of uh, scrutiny applied to it by the, the larger community. So, um, uh, so the yields are far larger for anybody who's technologically inclined. So um, DeFi is strong. We also have our own unique, um, as I mentioned, technologically advanced projects. Dexalot is one of them. Dexalot is a project, it's a DEX. It's kind of like DXDY, except it works. And um, it doesn't have to change platforms every day because the underlying thing just works and it's on its own subnet. Uh, but it's actually straddling two, multiple subnets. It straddles both the Avalanche C chain and its own subnet. And very soon it's going to be straddling other layer twos on, on, uh, on Ethereum and its own subnet. So um, it's a multi-chain project rooted on Avalanche, built on Avalanche. And I'm really proud to see how well and how fast it works. It has facilitated, I believe, about a billion dollar, dollars worth of transactions to date and, uh, and still growing. Uh, I could go on like this. There's Cavalry. Cavalry is an AMM with no impermanent loss. The, uh, the team behind it ended up solving one of the most fundamental problems in DeFi and uh, came up with a very nice solution to a problem that has plagued all AMMs, all automated market makers. And uh, then there's Platypus, which is a very efficient stable coin conversion tool. Next thing you wanted to talk about was SocialFi. Maybe uh, I'll, I'll hear your thoughts on that as well. Sure, SocialFi is, I think, really, really exciting. So for those of you who don't know what that is, these are systems built on a blockchain with a social graph embedded in them. So what does that really, really mean? It's like uh, there are some really basic uh, plays here that were early where, you know, you befriend me, you, you, I befriend you, etc. And then there's some coin stuff going on. But uh, I think one of the best plays in this space is the system called the Arena. So the Arena is based on Avalanche and uh, it's a system into which you log uh, in with your, your Twitter credentials and it works just like Twitter. 
except automatically behind the scenes and transparently to the user, um, there are coins created. So I create them you know, just by logging in. There are a whole bunch of EGS coins that get created. And if you want to quote slip into my DMs, you can buy those uh, those coins, and then you can talk to to me and my followers. So that creates an automatic market for those coins uh, because people need them to talk to the person. And if you remember, these VCs were trying to solve this problem of like you know how do they filter out people who are not deserving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They came up with Clubhouse during the pandemic, which was really popular for a while and didn't go anywhere. Um, so they were trying to come up with these solutions. Social Fi is a great way to embed tokens into social processes. And uh, the winning teams here, and in fact, the one big winning team that I see at, at the number two position at the moment is the arena. It's going to be the teams that do it in a transparent fashion, in a, in a fashion that isn't centered on the coins and coin dynamics, but on social interactions. So the arena looks exactly like Twitter. It's a better Twitter uh, with coins attached. And through the coins, you can actually make a lot of money as a content creator. If you have a following, the arena is fantastic for you. So uh, it's definitely worth a look. And uh, it's one of my favorite places to post these days. And uh, without, I think, Mr. Beast on X, he made some amount of money after a lot of fanfare exploded a bus or something or a boat or something or another. I didn't do anything on the arena. I just logged in. I tweeted a bunch. And uh, I ended up making more money than Mr. Beast did on, on Twitter. So, um, you know, it's a really cool platform. For, for a second, I thought Mr. Beast had made a arena account, but it's, you were just comparing the earnings. Epic. That would be epic. He's not, <laughs> he's not that hip. He's not that hip yet. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see him create an arena account. So uh, for the sake of time, let's move on. Um, a, a couple times in the conversation, you brought up um, Core Wallet. And Core Wallet is, is a wallet built by Avalabs, um, which functions as a wallet for, for the Avalanche ecosystem. So uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear um, what Core Wallet is and also if you can get into the relationship between Avalabs and Avalanche. Uh, sure. So uh, let me let me handle the second one first. It's very straightforward. So Avalanche is a is a thriving ecosystem built around a set of software that built that uh, maintains the, the Avalanche blockchain platform, and um, it is uh, steered by the Avalanche Foundation. And Ava Labs is a company that has been doing a fair bit of the software development for uh, the Avalanche Foundation. Uh, it's by no means the only company in that position. There are others. And, uh, but uh, Ava Labs has been doing the development of uh, Avalanche Go, the Go client that implements the Avalanche protocol. So, um, you know, it's essentially the, the Ava Labs are the folks who built the software, and Avalanche Foundation is the foundation that's neutral and sits on top of everything else. Um, now, so what does the Core Wallet do? Core Wallet is a, a new software product from Ava Labs. And um, it wasn't subsidized by uh, the Avalanche Foundation. It's just what it is. Um, so uh, uh, Core Wallet and it ended up being, I think, in my view, the premier way to interact with blockchains. It's, it's essentially, I started out asking myself, why does it suck to use a blockchain? Why doesn't my mom know how to use a blockchain? Why is she not? Why is she going to the bank? Why is she not you know, taking out collateral from a, from a landing platform. Why is it so hard for her to do DeFi? And I want, I know the answer is obvious, right? She, she's afraid uh, of her own, uh, you know, of her own setup. And she, the MetaMask gives her an experience that is absolutely abysmal. And these other uh, uh, wallets that I looked at were obviously not usable by regular people. So, um, to make the, uh, to, to be able to bridge on to blockchains, the next billion users, we ended up, we, we thought that what we, and what we needed to do was build a new wallet experience, something so smooth that anyone can use, something that will allow, allow that will function as, a, as an overall overarching single portal where you won't have to jump from one app to another app to another app and string together five different apps and, um, and just to be able to carry out a big DeFi transaction. Um, we thought that what we needed was a single place 
in which you would pick the tab that gives you the functionality you want, whether it's lending or it's swaps or it's something else. And you just, from within that single application, you carry out all of the DeFi activity that you want to do. So that was the vision for Core Wallet. And um, a secondary thing, of course, that we wanted to do was transparently support all of these multiple chains being built on Avalanche. So, you know, the user shouldn't have to know about which chain am I on, what, what chain should I be on, where should I get the service, etc. They should be routed to the best service possible. And so that was the, the vision for the wallet. And um, I'm not sure if we are there yet, but, uh, but the latest release of the wallet is fantastic in my opinion, and it's definitely worth checking out. There's still some ways to go uh, in terms of this unified vision of a single control panel for everything DeFi. So we're not quite there yet with Core, uh, but we're getting close. And uh, we currently have support for multiple chains, of course, and uh, it's really easy to swap from, and even the non-Avalanche chains are supported. So you can see your balances on Ethereum, on Bitcoin, you can move them into Avalanche if you like over the bridges, you can do lending from within Core, uh, you can do swaps from within Core, and so on. So there's quite a bit that's possible, and um, I will check out, uh, my, I'm going to see my mother very soon, and I will see if she's been, a, been onboarded yet, but uh, you know, I think there might be still a little bit of time but um, I, I cannot wait for a future where hexadecimal numbers are a thing of the past, where we just see a reasonable, you know, just a, just a clean, nice, elegant way to interact with financial services. Uh, so looking ahead, um, how is Avalanche preparing for 2024? Uh, you recently published a um, rundown of the Avalanche Go uh, roadmap. Can you possibly share, uh, give insights about uh, of that roadmap? Sure. Um, the roadmap is actually quite complicated. I uh, Every now and then, uh, well, at least twice a week, it pops up on my screen and uh, we go over it and so on. It's just it's, uh, technically fairly complex. But, um, you know, if you boil it down, it comes down to this year, it comes down to one thing for us, seamless interoperability. Seamless interoperability between chains and making it really easy to launch an app chain. I've been saying this for a whole bunch of years now. I got a lot of pushback from uh, in the early days from crypto people, but now they're all beginning to realize that you need multiple chains for multiple use cases. And um, this year is the year to make those multiple chains act as one and make that interaction seamless. So that's sort of what's going on. There are elements there like Teleporter that was just unveiled. Uh, there are elements in the roadmap, such as reducing the uh, money required to launch your own chain, the number of tokens required to launch your own chain. And um, there are elements in there that uh, relate to bridges and how easy it is to bridge from one chain to another, um, and how easy it is to message from one chain to another with technologies like Teleporter, um, and so on. It's just sort of uh, essentially um, making that seamless interoperability work for the common user. What would you say is Avalanche's biggest challenge for this year? The, at the moment, I think the biggest challenge is going to be how to distinguish itself uh, in a sea of noisemakers. So, um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not a hard challenge. I think people who know us know that we are the team that has brought the most amount of technology to crypto, period, after Satoshi. So... That's just a fact. I mean, we brought in the Avalanche protocol. We then brought in the Avalanche bridge, which has never been hacked and has held, you know, north of $7 billion in it. It's, it's based on this technology called SGX. We brought the Enclave uh, exchange technology to, the, to this space. So we are the team that has innovated consistently. We have brought the most amount of new tech into the space, new science into the space where other people do small incremental engineering improvements, we bring in wholesale new tooling and new toolkits. So, um, so we're in a very good situation and um, uh, trying to distinguish ourselves in a space like this is sometimes difficult, right? So some people end up doing a raise and they have huge coffers, they have huge amounts of money based on a, 
on the dinky promise of, uh, you know, hey, I have a new VM. Okay, you have a new VM and I have a new hat with a new feather on it. You know, it's, it's not that big a deal. Um, how do you distinguish yourself and remind the world, hey, you know what? We're the guys who invented the umbrella, the sombrero, and, and the giant, uh, uh, giant tent to save, you know, to, to, to save people from, from rain. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, these guys are parading around and making a lot of noise with their feathered hats. That's sort of the universe that we live in, and um, but it's okay. You know, as I said, if this is my biggest problem, I'm very happy to take this challenge. It's it's not a big problem. Um, we do not. Let me repeat this: Avalanche does not need scientific breakthroughs to scale. This is not something Ethereum can say. Ethereum needs scientific breakthroughs to scale. Most of the things they want to do, it's not clear if that's feasible to do. I kept saying this to Vitalik, you know, starting in 2015, that this is not how research is done. Uh, you don't set, you don't fix the, the form of the solution and see if you can solve something. So they kept doing that. They kept fixing the form of a solution that we want VDFs. Well, you might want VDFs, but VDFs might not work for you. And they didn't. And then they wanted VR. It's like, it's just not, that's not how research is done. And, uh, but for us, we don't need scientific breakthroughs. We do, not need, uh, we do not need a SAM figure behind the scenes manipulating markets. We do not need uh, many kinds of you know, external parties to come to our aid. We have, strongest, we have the strongest technology. It works. We have a vision that's been proven so far. And it's going to be a, a game, perhaps a longer term game, of building one case after another, showing the world, here is a winning application. It's a billion dollar uh, per year revenue game that's built on Avalanche. And that changes everything. And it's very different from giving away phones, giving away this and that, you know, it's trying to buy users, uh, whereas we are trying to essentially organically build actual systems that bear value that work. So that's my, that's, those are my challenges. Uh, there's a lot of noise, but, um, you know, noise is noise. It's always going to be there. It doesn't affect us. And in the long term, the people who win are always the people who build the real tech. Emino Jam, this has been a fantastic conversation. I certainly learned a lot. It was uh, entertaining for me as well. Thanks a lot for your takes. And, um, yeah, really excited for the future of Avalanche and uh, wishing you good luck. Thank you so much, Alp. It's always fun to talk to you. And uh, today I was... I was in a, in a room with, uh, with no escape from the sun, so, uh, uh, but really it was so much fun. <laughs> Even as I sweated really hard as I spoke to you, it was really fun <laughs> to chat with you today. Thank you very much for having me.